today's guest is Tyler Martin. He's a business coach and consultant at Think Tyler. So Tyler, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Hey, thanks, Tad. It's great, Tad. It's great to be here. Yeah. So um, you know, we've talked many times before, and uh, you know, you started out in accounting with the CPA um, uh, firm. I mean, how was those sort of um, was was that always the plan to, to grow out the uh, the accounting firm? Was that entrepreneurship side always with you as as a child? No. Um, you know, my dad wonderful dad provided for my my family or my, my entire family three three older sisters myself my mom um my mom was busy at home helping us uh, grow up and be responsible and my dad was uh, out working uh, at a grocery store actually he worked there his whole career a couple different grocery stores as a manager and uh any type of entrepreneurial spirit really didn't exist in my family like in fact when i started even thinking about starting a firm um, pretty much my entire family said I was crazy. Um, I was leaving, you know, a six figure plus job on path to become a partner, very well liked, uh, nice, solid client base within the firm. Um, and then I went from that to an empty office with a white wall and a desire to try to build a business. So yeah, I didn't have any support. I, I did read though voraciously as a kid. I mean, that, I think that's really what gave me some, I didn't really have a mentor. I didn't have older brother. I didn't really, you know, my sisters did their thing and they were awesome, but they kind of had their own world. And so uh, a, a lot of reading. And I think that's what kind of opened my mind uh, to different, different opportunities that you can make for yourself, as opposed to kind of living under someone else's shield and, and kind of making a living in a regular paycheck. I always like the thought of, man, if I didn't have to be bound by someone else of what they think I, I'm worth and what they're willing to pay me. And I could actually go out and create my own world. Um, it would seem like the opportunity was endless. So yeah, long answer, but that, that's, uh, that's how it played out. Absolutely. Was there, you said you read a lot. Was there a book that really clicked for you back then? Yeah. One that always sits out and it's a real old one. It's going to date me is uh, swimming with the sharks. Mm -hmm. um, there were just a lot of business pointers in that book that, I kept going back to, and I kept like, um, it just resonated with me, but that's a big one. I know there's a lot of the, you know, a lot of the popular ones, rich dad, poor dad had a real long run where it made, you know, talked about going out on your own and the different quadrants I thought was a cool book, uh, as far as expressing the point of, of just doing things on your own and your own autonomy of building your own revenue source. Um, another one, of course, you know, uh, how to influence people is a big one. I think that's a great one in terms of how to understand um, the effective habits is another one. I'm watching the titles a little bit, but those are all books that I think for values and cores, core values and things kind of can get, open your mind to relationships and networking. And I think those were influential too. Yeah, for sure. So you, you're getting an education, you're reading it, you're understanding the theory, then you actually do it. Um, what were your early learnings? You mean from when I started a business or just in life and business, business, <laughs> business, business. Um, and, and, yeah, business. I think the earning learnings were, um, I have a great, uh, gut intuition about business. Um, and, and I should go with it and I should rely on it. Um, I, you know, you're going to make mistakes. So that's, that's not necessarily a reflection of, um, mistakes are a good thing is the way I've always viewed it. I feel like when you mess up, it's a good thing. It's a learning experience and you move forward and you apply that learning, even with clients. When I would not deliver on time for something when I first started out because I became overwhelmed, as soon as things started to roll, I, I got more work than I could handle, frankly. And I missed some deadlines and I didn't live up to my word. And that was a lot of pressure. It allowed me to rebound. Though. It allowed me to hire some staff. It allowed me to realize setting expectations a little bit better in terms of we have a, we have a natural tendency to want to really deliver at a high level. So we say, Oh yeah, we'll get it to you tomorrow, but we don't do the calculation that we have four other projects that are due tomorrow. And it's not really going to be likely you can do that. So what I learned quickly is from my own failures and mistakes is put that, put that expectation date out a little bit farther than you really think it'll take. So maybe it's one week, you say two weeks, and then deliver it in a week, and you look like a superstar. And you really haven't done anything different than probably delivering on the timeline that you were intending to originally. But from a client perspective, 
um, suddenly they're like, wow, this is the guy that delivers ahead of time. This is the guy that delivers at a high level. This is the guy that delivers and returns my phone calls. So I think those were big lessons that I learned. I always, you know, one thing I went in with two tats is I absolutely knew professionals oftentimes are known for not returning phone calls. They're, they're known for not being very responsive. So my one claim to fame from day one was I was going to always respond to people. And I literally did this within 10 minutes oftentimes. Um, it may have been, hey, I'll get back to you tomorrow. But it was always a email. They email me five minutes later, I'd have a response. They'd make a call to me. And if I was in a meeting, the minute I got out of that meeting, I was calling them back and just letting them know, hey, I got two more meetings. Want to just let you know I'll get a hold of you tomorrow at blah, blah, blah time. And all those little things, they sound really minor, but they're all part of um, what paid off for me is building a referral base. Because when people started talking about me, they're really impressed by the delivery. Um, they're impressed by the professionalism. Um, they were impressed that I got to know them on a personal level. And all those were things that really I had to learn. I think I learned pretty quickly, but they were all learning lessons to, um, to build a business and a practice. Mm, responsiveness and expectation management yeah huge so what happened from there you 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 built out this firm and then what happened yeah so the uh, firm got to about 200 clients um one of my clients ran and, and was starting he became a client of mine and had just left a job making like some crazy money he was on their in their sales arm doing really well and he said hey i want to start my own business and I said, okay. And uh, we started evaluating. We, we worked on a business plan, uh, worked on how he was going to approach his business. And during this time, we were becoming friends. Um, he very much was in line with kind of my things I was interested in, things he was interested in. So we had a lot of, we talked a lot that were even beyond just business stuff and golfed occasionally. And uh, his business started, his business started to take off. And about uh, the fifth year into my practice and second year into his business, um, he had approached me about potentially uh, leaving my firm, selling it, and joining in a financial capacity at his company. And at that point, I was uh, growing really fast. I was working really long hours. Um, one thing about compliance work and just CPA firms in general is you really can't completely eliminate yourself from tax season. Um, as much as I'd love to say that's possible, it's, it's really hard to do unless um, you bring on other partners, which, which was actually part of my plan. But then when I talked to him, I saw the power of having a whole team of people and being able to grow a company. And I felt like I'm very numbers oriented. So I felt like, you know, going from maybe half million dollars of revenue to building a company that could theoretically be 50 to 100 million dollars of revenue. I don't know. It appealed to me. It was, it was sexy for lack of, lack of better words. So I joined his company. Um, the deal was uh, we worked out a profit sharing deal and it, was, and it was predicated upon me being able to sell my firm. And as soon as I put my firm on the market, I got offers like right away, really, really generous offers actually. And so I sold it. And about a month later, I was uh, literally an employee of that company and with a nice, nice deal a profit sharing deal. And after two years in, um, he was raising a family of five kids he had and him and his wife, and he really wasn't as active as in the business as what we had kind of um, negotiated. I'll say, you know, the spirit of it was I was going to do the operational finance side. He was going to build the sales end of it and we build this great company um, that wasn't really playing out how I thought in my mind in terms of uh, our equal contributions. And he was a super cool guy. He ended up actually becoming my mentor. Um, he gave me the opportunity to kind of put my my mouth where my put my money where my mouth is and and run his company. So for the next eight out of ten years, I took a piece of the ownership and uh, we built it from about five million low to about twenty five million in the final year in revenue. And um, what I really took away from that is a lot of things that I learned from the CPA firm is optimizing my practice. I did the same thing in the engineering service firm, uh, training staff. Um, pricing your services correctly. Uh, little side story here, Tats, that is, is just, I think it's an, a good educational story, is I used to, when I had my practice, I would charge a client somewhere between $500 to $3,000 for a tax return. Right next to my office, literally the door down with a sign out in front of their door said $75 tax returns. Every client that came to my office had to walk by that sign to get to my office. Um, and I always feel like, like, why would someone do that? Like, why is someone willing to pay 
so many more multiple more just to work with me. And and if that isn't to me ever like a case of marketing and value that people see in working with different people, I'm, I'm not sure what is a better example, but um, it always show, showed me that price really isn't oftentimes very that, not the most important thing. People want quality, they want delivery, they want confidence that you're going to do things correctly. And so that's those are the same values that we brought into the firm that I ultimately grew with my team. And um, we, we ultimately sold the business and for really good multiple. And it was built around the same principles that I did from the CPA firm and growing that. Mm, interesting value, pricing, all that stuff. Wonderful. Now, um, for some of the other stuff, like building a company that's five, 5 million to 25 has lots of changes that occurs to it. What are some of these changes and adaptations you need to make as you're growing up this business? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, as you're going through that, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, right? You're going to make staff mistakes. Um, you know, the end story always sounds glamorous and it is, but getting there, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of mistakes. Um, I think my biggest challenge was the management side of it. Um, I was managing a lot of different personalities than I ever had. Uh, you know, salespeople's personalities are a little bit different than accountant personalities and maybe a little bit different than marketing personalities. And now you're suddenly overseeing all those personality types. And that's an educational process. And unfortunately for me, I had to learn trial by error where um, some people I didn't probably treat very well because of my lack of uh, leadership skills. And I had to develop those. So I'd say that's a big thing is, you know, really understanding. And, I, and I'll tell you what a core part of that is, is caring about your people caring about your staff, caring about your team. And I, and once again, my mentor, the same guy that uh, uh, ultimately I, I ran his business for and had ownership in, um, he took me aside and I'm a hard headed guy, but he took me aside one day and he said, Hey, look, man, the reason you're having problems with staff is it's not really necessarily what you're saying. It's how you're saying it. Like you're, you're, you're coming off really edgy. You're coming off very demanding. And, and frankly, I, I mean, Nobody cares about this, but I was under a lot of pressure too. I was trying to grow a business. They don't care about that. They just care about how ultimately you're treating them. And it clicked for me because I'm, I'm like, you know, at first I told him, dude, you're full of it. You don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, but then of course I, like my clients do now, I imagine they go home and they think about what you, you share with them and then it clicks and, and you go, you know what? They're, they're, he's right. I, I, I deeply, passionately cared about my clients. And that was a big reason that my firm grew. And I'm not doing that for the people that are doing the exact same thing for me and helping me try to grow a company. I'm not deeply caring about them on a personal level. And I don't mean I have to hear about people breaking up with their boyfriends and girlfriends. I don't mean that. I mean, generally caring about them as people. I mean, how, you know, I read a book, it's called a uh, work quake recently. It's in fact, it was a guy on my podcast and it's, literally having the mindset that if they're going to leave your company to go do something that you're going to help them to some degree grow to leave your company and go do something that fits for them better. And I think that's the most selfless type of mindset. If you truly believe that I also believe they won't leave in the vast majority of cases, because you'll treat them so well. Some are, I mean, I didn't have too long ago, someone left to go join one of the major technical com technology companies around here. Um, and, uh, it hurt because she was a superstar, but on the flip side, it was a badge of honor that she went on to go build her career and it was leveraged off of what she did for us. So um, that's a big part of it that I, when you talk about like, what do you have to do? One of it is I think leadership and management skills. You have to really understand because now you have so many more personalities and you start to have later layers of leaders and managers under you that now take another level of growth and how you help them rise up to it, Right. And then I'd say the other thing is systemization. I think that's one thing we did great. And that's like having processes for things. We had a lead generation process. We had a lead conversion process. Um, we had a accounting close process. Most small companies, you talk about closing the books and they kind of give you a blank look. Like they don't even know what that means. Um, but we had, we had a rhythm for that. We had a team meeting rhythm. Um, that's meaningful uh, weekly meetings that everybody's accountable and contributing to the, the organization as a whole and knows what their purpose is. So all of these things played into that growth. And the biggest part I want to stress again is it sounds glamorous, but there's a lot of pain and a lot of mistakes until you get there, until it kind of all clicks for you. Yeah. So you, you talked about the core of it, which is just 
deeply caring about people. But I got the sense that, you know, by talking with people with different professions, different goals within the organization, there is maybe an average approach, or maybe just in your situation, uh, you had some difference in approach, it sounds like. Like, could you describe any of those different approach, whether it's how you explain it or your tone or, or how, how you approach uh, uh, sort of uh, connecting? Yeah, I think part of it started is my original management style was like, okay, everybody has to be a superstar and everybody has to deliver at a superstar level. Just because I'm willing to work Sundays and Saturdays and 12 hours a day, I think there was a subconscious level of me that expected that from everybody. And that's just a big mistake, right? Like that's just not true. And so that's number one, I think is me changing myself. The number two is really, it's okay that some people are going to work nine to five, five days a week and always observe. In fact, it's a good thing. I'm not even going to say it's a bad thing. Uh, they, they observe all their vacations. They're on holiday. They're checked out. That's okay. There's, there's a certain group of your team that definitely can be that way. Then there's other teams. There are other team members that are going to perform at a little bit higher level. And to them, you know, they want to take it to a higher level. And I think you're going to always have that mix. And I think just understanding what the goals of each individual are, are really important. So for that nine to five person, doesn't mean they're not going to be accountable. It doesn't mean they're still not going to contribute. They're going to contribute at their level that they're comfortable, and you're going to set the expectations with them. They're going to agree to that matches what they're what they're going to do in the organization. And maybe that superstar, you're actually going to ask, ask them to back off a little bit so they don't burn themselves out. I think that's part of caring too. Is um, it, it's got to be a collaborative relationship where um, you're thinking long term for that own that person's benefit and. Um, so really connecting with them to me, me means what res resonates with them on, on how you speak with them. I think some people do really well. Uh, some people like, for example, if you give them goals or you go, I shouldn't say give them, you go over with them goals, they get really uncomfortable. Like they don't want to like have any goals. And so I think how you articulate that message to them and tie them into the organizational goals, I think can help give a little clarity of where we, where you're going as an organization and how they fit in. So I know my answer is a little bit all over the place, but there's a lot of different components in there that I think you have to consider when dealing with each individual. And I do personally, like I've had people take me aside in organizations I've worked with and said, well, you can't be friends with a subordinate. You can't be friends with someone you manage. That's just not the way we do things here. And I, and I chuckle because I, I uh, personally, I think someone that says that to me, I think they're ignorant. I think you absolutely can connect on a personal level and you can be friends with someone you manage. I think you absolutely can create lines. I'm not saying you need to, but if you click with someone, I don't, I don't personally find an issue with um, I think it actually builds for a better organization if you all feel like you can collaborate and you have personal interests that are aligned. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but I think it can help. So um, those are all the things that come to mind, Tats, when you bring that up, just really to really connect with people. Sure. Um, your background is in the numbers, uh, and we've talked a lot about that. And uh, you know, one of the things we don't really talk about, or I, I don't hear talked about a lot, is Budgets, forecasts, you know, crystal ball. You know, when you're going from five million to twenty-five, lots there's lots of things happening, lots of costs and stuff like that. How do you kind of think that through and scale that out and and manage that whole thing? Yeah. Well, before I answer that, let's just make sure whoever is listening they don't tune out right now because um, this could get boring really quickly. So I'm not going to get real deep. I'll tell you what I think are some some real important key components of this. First. I do feel that a lot of business owners, and it's sad to say, they don't know their own numbers. They have just no, you, you ask them what a key metric is in their business and they kind of just gloss over. And I, I do feel that's a mistake business owners make. I think you, you don't have to be an accountant. You don't have to get into these deep numbers, but you should have certain baseline measurables that you're managing your business around. And that's something I think we did really, really, really well. We knew what our GP was. That's a good key metric. And we knew where we were going to keep it. And, you know, that became my mantra in meetings. Um, hey, GPs, and I'm making up this number. But gross profit, right? Just, yeah, just... Gro yeah, thank you. Gross profit. <laughs> so, so gross profit, and I'll just define it really quickly. Sales less your direct costs. So um, and, and in theory, that's what's costing you. It's your cost of sales or cost of goods sold uh, to get to your net, net, net gross profit margin. So um, that number is critical to know, though, because 
it, it really helps you understand how you're pricing your services and whether you're building in enough margin, profit margin, to even make a good living. And, and I think a mistake people made is, make is they oftentimes look at sales and they think that's the exciting number. And truthfully, oftentimes it's not. It's really your gross profit margin because your sales could go up, but if you're eroding your profit margin, you're not making more money, you're making less and you're working harder to do it. Um, so that was a big thing, you know, driving on a top level, our profit margin, we definitely budgeting and forecasting is, is a part of this, but I'll tell you what, I think when you start to say budgeting and for, forecasting, people think like, you know, they're trained to think five years out, three years out, sometimes 10 years out. Now, between you and I, Tats, like, that's just like crystal ball stuff, right? Like, I don't think it's necessarily bad. I mean, it goes great in a business plan and it's great to have a vision, but it's not really how you're going to manage your business. The money is in the six to 12 months. Like that's like, where are we going to be staff wise? Let's factor that into our, 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 our budget and our forecast. Um, if we're going to add two people where, what is the effect of adding those two people in our sales 90 days later? Um, if we have equipment purchases and we're factoring that into our cash flow, um, that would be part of how we're going to build out our, our projections. Um, so I'm big on, on keeping things where they're very relevant. And, you know, I had a client a couple of weeks ago that, that joined me and she was just frantic. I mean, she was like, I don't know, like, I'm worried if I can even make payroll sometimes. And, and now, truthfully, she had no problem making payroll, but it was the lack of clarity it was the cloud. It was the blind spot, if you will, of her not really knowing her numbers. So it's like she's constantly worrying about something that she really doesn't need to be worrying about, but it's part of a bigger problem. And that's where budgeting and forecasting and having metrics really help you manage your business. It really helps you to go, okay, I have a roadmap. I mean, would you would you sail somewhere without like knowing where you're ultimately intending to go? Yet people run a business and they don't really think about where is their landmark? Where are they? How are they going to get to that landmark? What is their landmark? And then how are they going to get to it? Which is the budget forecast and managing your KPIs, um, your key performance indicators. So yeah, that's, that's it. I'm obviously passionate about it. Hopefully I didn't get too deep. Um, yeah, so that's my answer. No, very cool. Now, um, so for when, when you're going from five to 25 again, how much personal development did you do? Like, did you do outside stuff with coaches and stuff? Um, did you sort of um, put your people through those or ex expose them to personal development? Because there's different skills that are required at different phases of business. How did you manage that? Yeah, I. I don't think I did a great job of that if, if I'm being as transparent and as candid as I can be. Uh, if I had to do it all over again, um, especially in the world I'm in now, uh, I would have made it mandatory for everybody to had, have coaches, uh, have uh, development sources, whether it be coaches or mentors or trainers or guides. Um, I just think it's such a huge component of personal growth um, and business growth. We didn't we did some of it. I don't think I, I would 10 X what I did back then. You know, we'd go to a seminar twice a year. Everybody it was part of our benefits, but benefits plan um, company would pay for any, any benefit, any type of training twice a year uh, with a certain budget amount. I don't remember what it was, but it was fair. Um, but I felt like we, you know, looking back on it, I felt like we could have done so much more. I definitely, if I had to do it all over again. I would have had a coach. Um, I do now. I think it's an important, integral part of uh seeing things at a wider position i don't think back then it was quite as easily accessible and there was as much awareness we're only really talking 10 years ago too but it wasn't quite as accessible um as i think it is today and you kind of have more visibility of who's out there and who would be a good choice to match with helping you develop uh whether it be your skills or your goals or whatever you're trying to accomplish yeah. So you have a coach. What sort of areas or things uh, are top of mind that you want to work on? Yeah. So I've actually had quite a few coaches. So I've had a LinkedIn coach, um, which was awesome. She, 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 was, she was wonderful. Helped me think about things in a lot of different ways that I wouldn't have just naturally thought about them. Um, right now I have a say, he calls himself a business coach, but I really say he's probably more of a sales coach. And the, the guy is just phenomenal. I mean, he really helps me you know, my struggle is because I am an accountant type, you know, numbers guy. I'm, I do definitely have a personable element, but I'm also trying to fight with um, looking at things rather than just strictly from a number side, more from an empathy side, more from a, 
compassion side, more from connecting with my client and prospects on really what's what's the, really their emotional reason for things. And that's where my coach helps me a lot is he really gets me to think about things like that. He gets me to think deeper. Um, he gets me to pause because uh, that's really what people connect with you um, a lot of times better is if you really can understand where they're at and what they're trying to accomplish. And um, so that's that's really my main thing right now. Great. Well, what are your goals going forward? Yeah, so I have about 17 clients right now. They're all business owners, and I absolutely love what I do. I mean, I just, every conversation that I have with them, like, fires me up by the end of the end of the call, uh, end of the Zoom meeting. And I, you're really, my biggest goal, I think, is just to double my practice. I'd like to next year probably be talking with around 40 clients. Um, I really, uh, I just love, I feel like I've amassed some successes in my life now um, that I can replicate. And it's just awesome to be interfacing with business owners that don't always have um, these types of tools already at their disposal or understand maybe what are best paths to go. And so it's really cool to just help them get focused, help them with accountability, help them design processes and systems, help them think about what are their KPIs and how do they execute on managing those. And so far the run, I've been doing this pretty hardcore now, I'd say for a little bit over two years in terms of uh, spending all my time doing it. And uh, it's one of the most rewarding things I'm, I've, I've probably done in my career. And I feel like I've done some pretty cool things. It's just helping people like, you know, the anxiety when I initially talk with them and then getting to the point where that anxiety goes away um, and they feel in control again. It's just really cool to be part of that. Um, so that's really my, my near term goal. I think a longer term goal would be I'd like to continue to grow my podcast. Um, it's just great meeting people and just, um, I've met so many cool relationships from that. I think another one that I really have my bucket list is to write a book. Um, I, you know, originally it was going to be 2022. I'm, I'm kind of backing off on that just because I don't know if my time will permit it. And then the other thing I'd love to do is a digital product. I, I, that's kind of in my, um, master plan. I'd say over the next three years would be to accomplish those two things in particular. Yeah. Very cool. Is there anything that I didn't uh, cover that you wanted to talk about? Um, hmm, let me think. Uh, you know, I think the only other thing I would say as it relates to businesses and just growing and scaling a business, and we've had conversations about this, is put really good people around you. In order to put really good people around you, you have to be a really good leader and, and have a good it, it all feeds off of itself, right? So if you build if you're a good leader, you're gonna attract good people. Those good people are going to attract good people. Um, it just kind of just all feeds each other and off each other. And then putting processes in place and helping with all those other areas of the business. It just, if you get, if you set a good foundation, like anything else, you get good results. And I know you and I have had a chance to share a lot of discussions and I see that with what you do in your business and um, you're kind of the role model. I think I've said this before. You're the role model for uh, how to run a business. I mean, you guys are so <laughs> awesome. Um uh, that I, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, those are the types, that's what, I'd, that's what I'd love to see people do. I, it excites me. And I think it makes business fun. You know, when people come to me, they're not having fun. Like, they're just like, Hey, I don't know why I started this business. I'm not having fun. I'm worrying all the time. And that's not the way it needs to be. It should be fun. Like once you get over that hill, even when we sold the firm, I'd say about my six year in, it was like a blast. Um, it took a while to get there, but it was a blast once you get there. Yeah, for sure. Having fun in a business is definitely the way to go. So I appreciate you, Tyler, as usual. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and uh, thank you for being on the show. Tats, you're awesome. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. <laughs>